Hey, everybody. Today on the Agent Excel podcast, we have our guest, Dustin Runyon. What's up, Dustin? How you doing? Good, man. Thanks for having me, Chris. I appreciate it, brother. Yeah, for sure. I wanted to get you on. I, uh, I've, I've, I've known you for a little bit just from afar. I never really personally um, have met you, but um, started jumping on some of your Fired Up Fridays that you have, your, your, your thing that you got going on on Friday. And I was on there probably three weeks ago, and you just, you were coming from another level. And I look for those people because we need people that give us energy and I, your, your frameworks and how you, you know, set up your structure and your framework and everything like that is something that I look up to. And I thought, man, I got to get them on the show. So um, before we, we dive into anything like that, so, you know, how'd you get into the real estate space? You know, how, how long ago was that? And, and what, what did things look like when you started and where are you at now? Yeah, um, actually, it was it's it's the only career I've ever had. So I started real estate when I was 21 years old, I believe, right when I was 21. I started as an assistant uh, to someone who was doing a lot of short sales. So um, school wasn't for me. Like I dropped, I dropped it out at people. Joe, you, you, did you go to college? I said I was enrolled. I didn't go, but I was enrolled. <laughs> and so. Uh, uh, got, got in at 21. I literally found uh, a girl on Craigslist. Uh, I wanted to be a real estate assistant to her. She told me this thing called short sales. Uh, I had no idea what it was. And so I started negotiating short sales. Um, and then from there, uh, I, I left there and uh, worked with a guy named Kyle Wyloge, who's actually out in Phoenix, Arizona. And that's where I got started was Phoenix, Arizona. We started a short sale team and we probably did about 250 short sales in, in a few years. And uh, yeah, so I started in 08. So there was, uh, it was, it was gnarly at that time. And so um, yeah, from there, I came actually down to Lake Havasu city at 25 and I became a team leader for Keller Williams down here. We grew that from like 40 million to about a half a billion expanded to two different locations, um, opened up a property management company, uh, split that into two locations, opened up a real estate school, um, but, uh, unfortunately I, I didn't own any of it. And so, so I left and, and at 30, I basically started over, uh, with regards. So I opened up a real estate team. Um, that's, this was about, yeah, four years ago, started a real estate team. Um, I had started coaching kind of organically when I was in my late twenties, people were just coming to me. They were seeing the growth of our company and they're like, you know, can you help? And, um, I said, sure. And so I started coaching for free, just coaching, uh, which are now my friends. And I, I have the, the first three people I started coaching, I still coach with today. Um, and, uh, you know, a few years ago we started a development company. And so, you know, we have about six projects right now that we're working on, um, with regards to development, a little over 500 acres where we're developing subdivisions. Um, and yeah, we got about 20 people on our team today and I coach, um, about 28 people um, across the country in all different um, industries, a lot of real estate title, mortgage stuff, insurance, but uh, yeah, across all different industries. And so that's, that's kind of where we're at now. Okay. So you've got the team. So is that like, what, what does that team structure look like for you? Mm. Um, so it's, it's kind of your basic structure. So one of the things that I had working at the, the brokerage was I got to see a lot of what worked and didn't work. Like I had a lab essentially, right? Uh, a lab of, and I got to see what these teams would spend money on and uh, what was efficient, what wasn't efficient. Um, and so uh, we just made it very, very simple. And you'll, you'll hear that probably throughout this podcast is, is, is complexity. I, I mean, I hate complexity. I hate it. Um, even with no matter how complex the, the deals get or the, the projects get or whatever it is, we always uh, root it in simplicity. So um, the way it's structured is, um, I have, it's me, uh, um, I'm the team leader here. Um, basically my role is very simple. Um, I recruit and coach. That's all I do for my team is recruit and coach, uh, Brandon, he's our director of operations. So he runs all of the administration. Um, we have a, uh, transactional coordinator. We have a marketing, uh, director, and then we have a, uh, team assistant, which is basically an assistant to the whole team. And then from there, we have our agents and our agents work with buyers and sellers. And um, they're, yeah, we don't have any buyers agents or just listing agents. Everybody works with both buyers and sellers. Um, and then we have some people on our team that have showing assistance as well now because their business has grown, you know, 50 plus deals. And um, yeah, 
I mean, our, in our lead sources is very, very simple. We use, um, we circle prospect, we do open houses, we do uh, internet leads and we do uh, our, we really work our sphere of influence. Right. And those are kind of our four buckets that we are kind of our lead gener- our lead levers. Okay. When you say keeping things simplistic, I'd like to go deeper into that because mm-hmm. I think that's what a lot of agents can do myself. Sometimes I actually find that when I start like a new project, I start going down the complexity road. And about two days into it, I'll always be like, wait, wait, like you've lost track of like, there's the finish line. There's all the stuff in between. And it's like, how do you get there the quickest as possible? I think sometimes we put in our own roadblocks based on just thinking that's what needs to be done over, you know, making it too complex. So what does that look like when you say make things simpler? Yeah. So, um, I'll give you kind of an example when we started our development company, and then I'll, I'll kind of integrate this back into the team. But we started our development company, and our very first deal that we did was five acres, and it was it was a it was a four lot subdivision, one acre lots. And we called it a micro subdivision, and it was a gated community, and we raised money like overnight. And basically, and I, we, we found out that this is doesn't last long. But basically, I had a friend of mine. He came in. He's like, I'll take the whole deal. Perfect. Boom. 800 grand. We took the whole deal. Well, we went into a bigger one and it was a 52 acre deal and we were hitting roadblocks, man. Um, and, uh, hitting a lot of them and we were struggling trying to raise money. And then we were working on a bunch of other things and, and we were how to structure these deals. Maybe it's the structure, maybe it's this, maybe it's that, um, whatever. And we actually had a deal in escrow and we hadn't raised the money for it. And so, um, So what we did was we lost out on the deal and uh, we're like, Hey, we got to put this back into escrow. Let's put it back into escrow. So we put it back into escrow this time, $25,000 hard. So if we don't, we don't raise the money in 30 days, (laughs) we are, we're, we're out 50,000 because they would only give us uh, 25,000 hard earnest money for two weeks. And then at the end of that, they'd give us another two weeks for, for another 25,000. That's like forced accountability when you're when right. You're, you're literally betting on yourself at that point, like putting your money where your mouth is. I've got to execute. Sometimes the best pressure is just forcing yourself to do something. You're spot on, man. And I would tell you, that's how I've kind of set up my whole life. I'm not a very accountable person, but I've created an environment at home and in my personal life, my business to where I just don't have a choice. Right. Right. And so, um, so what we did is it forced us, I have two partners, um, great human beings. Um, we forced us, we got in the boardroom and we sat there with a whiteboard and we go, dude, who are we? And it's like, we're a development company. It's like, no, no, we're not. It's like, well, what, well, what really are we? We're, we're an investment company for investors, right? No. What are we really? Like, what is, what is it if that, if we just, we just do this, everything else blows up. Cause I'm sales and marketing. My other partner is in contractor. He does all of our horizontal construction. My other partner is an engineer. We can do our jobs easily. Like we're good. You want to, you know, you're good at what you do, whatever it is that it is that you you do. Um, And that's what we do. And we're good at what we do. But we looked at it and we said, what really is Apex West? Apex West is a fundraising company. If we raise the funds, everything else is easy. I mean, not easy, but it's, it's very simple. We just get to work. We just do what we've been doing the past 10, 15 years. And so today, uh, what ended up happening is we said, let's make it really simple. We're just a fundraising company. So what was crazy is, Andrew, my partner, who's our contractor, he started coming to the fundraising meetings. Britt, who's our engineer, he started coming to the fundraising meetings. And we just kept it simple. Us three are going to go to every single, in every single investor meeting that we have together. Because if we're a fundraising company, that's what us three need to do. So from today, like even where we're at right now, um, that's just what we are. We don't look at ourselves as a development company. We keep it simple. Raise funds. As long as we raise funds, we're good to go. It's interesting how when you just break down, like the, like you just said, like once you figure out what you truly do that makes the whole system run, it's almost like you can put just almost all your effort on that and just everything else is easier, like you're saying. But wait, let me ask you this. How do you, getting into development, what made that, you say you're really good at it, right? Or, or you guys are really good at it. What made you even go down that path? Like, was that you just saying, I want to go down that path and just letting it all fall into place? Or was it, was something falling into your lap and you just ran with it? Or did you force that? Yeah. Have you noticed in your life ever when you start like, um, when you start taking, can I curse? 
do whatever you want. <laughs> yeah. Can, can you start when you start taking shit seriously and when you start taking your personal growth seriously and your business seriously, and you start taking, you know, even your personal life seriously and you get real purposeful about it, that, that, that good things start to come into your life. Yeah. Like I believe we're all magnets and whatever it is that you're attracting is a good, is a good indication on who you are. And so, um, we had, I had somebody on my team, uh, Jenna, who has been uh, literally like a childhood friend who came and worked with me when I started my team. Um, and she kind of saw our team explode. Like uh, I've never shown a buyer or seller in our first year. We did a hundred deals, second year, a couple hundred, and we've been growing this year. We'll do a couple hundred million, but in our fourth year. And so her cousin saw our growth and was like, wow, they're doing awesome stuff. Um, and he just called me one day and said, Hey man, have you ever thought about doing projects? And he had graded, he run, runs a grading crew of about 50 people now. Um, and so he's like, I'm like, no, I haven't, but let's do it. <laughs> and so we, you know, we partnered It was one of those co coincidences also that like, I'm just eternally grateful for, you know, those things that sometimes you feel you've done nothing for. Um, and so, uh, yeah, he came up and we started, I had a friend, Britt, who was an engineer and he was one of the hardest working dudes I'd ever met. And he, our values, all three of our values really aligned. And so that's how we got started there. Cool, man. That's awesome. Yeah. It's, it's cool how you just, I feel like you're that person that just goes a direction and doesn't have to know all the details. And my wife and I were talking probably about four days ago and we're like, what, why is it that the people who seem to create the most messes sometimes are the most successful? And I'm like, it's just because they're willing just to, it's almost like in their DNA that they'll just, like I write down goal and the process to get to the goal is almost irrelevant to start. But you can see we're doing that. You get into some, like, this is the goal I'm starting tomorrow. And you're like, okay, well now I just, I, I fell here, I fell here. But you just keep going each day and you're almost finding out that he who can just make a goal and solve all the problems on the way there is the one who actually gets there. It's not usually the person who's sitting down and saying, here's my goal and here's the whole entire process and here's all the details. And this is exactly what I'm going to do. Now, don't get me wrong. Could that work? Yes. Does it work? Yes. But I find that I'm wired just to, hey, we're all starting this and everyone's like, how are we getting there? And I'm like, we're just getting there and we'll solve each hurdle each day as we go. And it might not be super fun, but we're going to get there. Sounds like that's exactly who you are dude you it's crazy uh yeah you peg me it's like i don't i never worry about how i only worry about one one of a few things one my desire has to be strong enough right um so that's where i want to go and i obsess over it but how is very low on the list who is very high on the list okay so who is much more important to me than the how and always has been you said something on your fired up Fridays that you do on Friday, like three weeks ago or something like you were just straight. It was just you speaking. And I wrote down the longest list of notes and something that I took away from there just made my heart sing. And you said like, no one ever accomplishes something great quickly by not being obsessed. Mm -hmm. And that just spoke like so hard to me because I found that to be so true in everything that I do. Like when you're having like a, you know, a, a, a health goal or a business goal, you know, like the outside world can almost be like, dude, like chill. Like you're so, you're almost, you look crazy. And I'm like, how else would you accomplish that besides being so awkwardly focused on it? Because if you're not awkwardly focused on it, you start focusing on some of the distractions and it takes you away from it. So you have to lean like heavy one way and be kind of weird about it. And then as it becomes maybe a habit or something, you can dial down a little bit, but will you go into more of, mm -hmm. you know, that thought process of like that obsession? Yeah, it's one, there's a lot of stuff people don't talk about on stage that I try to talk about. Um, like, um, I mean, I, I just, I'm honest about it. Like, I, It's, yeah, passion, you know, you hear this often, you have to be passionate about what you do if you want, like, if you want those big results. And it's, it's very true, but passion is just a cute word for obsession. And I think obsession gets this like negative connotation to it. Um, much like, uh, demanding gets a negative connotation to it. It's like, yeah, but I demand that I get up in the morning and I demand that I show up for my people and I demand that I make shit happen and I demand, right. So 
those chill out people aren't my people. You know, I don't really have much in common with those chill out people that tell me, you know, I was actually telling a story today in my team meeting. Um, I remember a guy, I uh, was working at the Keller Williams and I was working like, I mean, 12, 14 hours a day all the time. And he was telling me, he's like, dude, you're going to burn out. You're going to, you need to rest. And I remember looking at the results that that guy had in his life and at his age, cause he was an older guy. And I was like, nope. I'm never getting around that guy again. And so, uh, yeah, obsession, I would say, uh, I would say ob obsession for me is this it's consistency when consistency meets intensity. Okay. Like, right. Cause you have, I will take consistency over intensity, but there's those few people that you see that have both. And that's, that's like the kind of the equation that I have for, uh, for obsession. I think it's a great thing. Um, I think candor, I think, uh, um, ferocious um energy ferocious action with uh with aligned values like i think you can be insanely ferocious and incredibly kind i think you can be tough on people or i think you can be tough on results and kind on people um and i think all of those things and i, I don't think people talk about that because you go and you start working with some of these people that are really making shit happen and it's it is, it is an obsession. That's uh, it's night, night today. I mean, do you, do you, do you think that's just, just wired in you? Or do you think someone can change that? I always wonder that, you know, I'm have the same process that you have as far as trying to get things done. It's just all in and we're going to get it done. Do you think that's just who we are? Is there something about just DNA or do you think someone who might be a passive person can just straight go the other direction? This is a really good question because I was writing this down the other day. I was really, I was studying some stuff and I was having this moment. I asked myself that identical question. So weird that you asked that. And I'm like, everybody can, not everybody will. We kind of all know that everybody can, not everybody will. I think there is certain personality traits that obviously lean towards, like, if you have these traits, it's more, it's going to be more natural for you to like obsess over things. Like if your mind moves fast and quickly um you're you're, you're gonna you know you see these high energy people tend to be you know more successful but do i think an introvert or do i think somebody who's more chill or lax yes i do believe they can be um incredibly successful i really think it boils down to people's environment um whether in everything is environment like everything um food is environment um, what you consume is environment. Drugs or alcohol is environment. The people you surround yourself with is environment. Uh, the house you live in is environment. And so if I think if you get people in the right environment, yes, I believe anybody can shift and change. And I believe anybody can create a success of their life. Yeah. You were, you were talking about like, on that same, that, that same fired up Friday that I was listening to, um, you know, just not focusing on certain things because you don't have the control. And I remember one of them I wrote down was you said like, Hey, you know, don't focus on the wars. You don't control them. And I, I just sat back instantly and I, I, I subscribed to a few news podcasts that I listened to. And when I got done listening to your, you know, your Friday, Friday I, I reviewed all the notes and I've really reflected on them almost every single day. I've read them almost as like a morning mantra and I'll send them to you just so you know what you said. Cause you're probably yeah, like, what yeah. did I say? So I'll, I'll yeah. send you the notes so you have them. But I started looking, I was like, Hey, do you know what, does this serve me? Like listening to this stuff. And I deleted them off. And I said, I'm not going to even, I'm not going to listen to this stuff. Right. Like, does it give me any energy when I'm driving into the office? And since that day, and I, I like to be the person that was like, Oh, I like to be informed. Right. Like I want to know what's going on. And I really dial deep and self-reflect. And I'm like, what does even me being informed on certain issues do? It's just actually a distraction on what I really want in my life. And I'm just willing to, I'm almost disguising that I need to know certain things for a way, maybe not to reach where I need to go. And so I just took that stuff off and it's been the best feeling over the last few weeks. I'm just not even, I've had some people talk to me about stuff and I'm like, I don't, I don't even know what we're talking about, but like, mm -hmm. if you want to talk about this, let's go. And I'm talking about my stuff. I'm like, I don't get it. And I'm like, we just don't belong in the same arena and there's nothing wrong or right about it. We're just wired totally differently. Um, but dude, I'm, th I thank you for that. And I, yeah. I just, I wish more people would like listen to stuff that you're 
you know, spitting out when you're on the fired up Fridays, because it just comes like, I think more people need to hear from people like you that are coming from a place of trying to build people up, build some frameworks on how they should live their life because we're just on like default. You know, we just do yeah. certain things because we just do it and we never stop to reconcile. Like, should we still be living our life this way? And could we just wake up tomorrow and just do something completely different? Will you like expand on any more of like your frameworks that you have as yeah. far as just how to think? And because like, I really think that that's, I mean, this is a real estate podcast, but yeah. I'm so into, you've got to like be focused on protecting yourself from this world, have goals, protect yourself from the outside world and then figure out how to stay in a zone that keeps you motivated. So if you could like just dial in on any of that. Yeah. I, and I, I, I'll share what works for me. Um, like I'm not ignorant enough to think it's going to work for everybody or I have any of the answers, but I can share with what works for me. Um, I know with regards to like wars or focusing on shit, I find that like, you know, a lot of us are just at war with ourselves and we don't want to, we don't want to handle that or we don't want to, um, look at that. So we'll focus on other people's wars and we'll focus on things outside of ourselves. And so, um, but for me, I, I learned this early on. So I started at that, that, that office that I was running at 25 years old. I was, I was running this office and I was super naive and I go in and I came from an independent brokerage out in Phoenix and man, we screwed it all up. Like we, we did a lot of deals, but we didn't make any money. Um, and so we did, just didn't have any training or education or anything. Right. I didn't know what I didn't know. And so I come to this office and they have all the training. I'm not kidding you, Chris, they have everything, social media training, YouTube training. I mean, that's kind of where I started was I started training people on like social media and YouTube and different things like that. But I, uh, I mean, they had every sales training they had. I mean, the, the training calendar, there was 30 different trainings on the calendar per month. Right. And I'm looking at 25 years old, there's these grown adults and I'm like, how do we still have people failing? how do we still have people failing? And what I learned, and I, got, I actually got obsessed with a, a thing called a neuro-linguistic programming, this thing called NLP. It's just a personal development, um, like a, um, a, a personal development kind of um, mod, model, excuse okay. me. Um, and I, I, I ran into like a saying that said 80% of success is psychology, 20% is mechanics. Um, and then I ran into a book, a guy that used to run a bunch of the Psy seminars, the PSI seminars. Um, and he had written a book, if how to's worked, we'd all be like fit, rich and happy because <laughs> majority of us. And I found this, especially as I've gotten older and maturized a little bit is like a majority of people listening to this. You got, you know what to do. You pretend like you don't know what to do, but if you and I sat down for 15 minutes and I asked you enough questions, you'll, you know what to do. And so one of my favorite questions to ask is like, what's the one thing you need to do? Or what's, what's one thing that you know, you need to do that you're not doing. And then if you did that, what would your life or business look like? You know, the Navy SEALs have this thing uh, that they say, they say, knowing what to do and not doing it is spiritual death. Ooh. It eats you alive. Yeah. And so um, what I got obsessed with was just like psychology, performance psychology. So um, I actually hired an Anthony Robbins coach, um, coached with him for a few years. And then I hired, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many different mentors and, and therapists and uh, psychologists. And I mean, one, of the, one guy, there was this 82-year-old guy. I named, his name was Fred. He was an incredible dude. And I met with him every single week and he was a psychologist and he taught me about relationships and uh, the framework of belief and values and the things that drive human behavior. It's like real estate. It's like, what are you in? I'm in sales. No, what are you really in? Well, I'm in real estate. No, what are you really, really in? It's like, you're in the human connection business. And so um, I learned about what drives human behavior. And um, I found out that, that, that how to's that, that if, if 80% of success is psychology and 20% is mechanics, what I found is that people were spending hundred percent of their time on the mechanics and like zero to like 5% of their time on the psychology. And so, um, so yes. Yeah, so the framework for me is I, I just got a, a obsessed with, with, with how to think and what thinking was and what, how to control or how to discipline thoughts. 
um, where thoughts, what are thoughts? And um, do, do you do a lot of, I mean, do you have a lot of self-reflection time where you sit down and just think? Oh yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. I try, I call it studying. Okay. So I, stu- I, I, I try to yeah, study I, a lot. Yeah. I wonder because I try to find at least an hour in the day where I'm just thinking and it, you know, it, it can, it can come off as just sitting there doing nothing, but like, really, I'm just self-reflecting on like, what did I do today? What did I really do by default? What did I control? What did I feel like I was in power with? Um, and so I, I feel like that's something that you would probably do often. And let me ask you this, as far as like, how many coaches do you have right now? Do you, do you have any or, or anybody holding yeah, oh, you yeah. accountable? Yeah, I have three right now. So I have a business coach. I have a psychology coach is what I call it, like performance psychologist. And then right now I meet with um, a, a therapist once a, about once a month now. Okay. Yeah. Why do you think some people will hear super successful people that have quite a bit of coaches holding them accountable and other people will just say, well, I don't need a coach. I can, I can do it myself. But yeah, you're, they're usually e- the ones not going ego. to the next level. Ego. Yeah. The number one thing. So we hired our COO uh, and he's an attorney and he's done a lot of m as So like mergers and acquisitions and, and different things for like billion dollar companies. And I say, what's the number one reason you see people not sell their company or not end up going public or not end up growing and, and reaching full potential? And it's just ego. Like asking for help is a superpower. The amount of relationships that I've created in my business that just by asking for people help, for help straight up it went on i'm not kidding this happened 30 days ago uh not even 30 days ago three weeks ago i went on google i looked up one of the best land advisors land consultants in the state of arizona and this guy jim was there uh he showed up kept showing up and i won't say his last name but uh he kept showing up so i called him say man my name's dustin um, I'm looking at a lot of your stuff. You seem incredibly successful. You've sold your consulting company for a large amount of money. You've done this, done that, blah, blah, blah. I go, what would it take for me to get four to six hours to do like a whiteboard session with me and my development company? And I had told him a little bit about, you know, my, my development company as well. And he goes, you don't need to pay me. Cause I was like, what, what would it cost? He goes, you don't need to pay me. He goes, you in Phoenix? I go, I have a place out in Phoenix. Would you be one? He's like, yeah, I'll come to your place. He's like, uh, how about next Saturday? Perfect. Boom, came in, sat down with us, picked his brain for six hours. And we're great. Like, we're great friends. Why like, won't, and he hooked us up with another guy. It, it, why won't more people do that? I, I'm, I, I kind of come from the same attitude. Like every, probably every three or four days, I have something that I have not one clue what to do. And I'll just either reach out to somebody. I'll text someone I know and just be like, hey, want to do this? Don't know how you got a connection. And I, I think you know, when I'm sitting in those spots, I look very vulnerable, but yet I find that if I, the more I go to somebody and ask for help, the further, the the faster I grow. And I'm not willing to, I don't want this to take 20 more years. I want to figure out how to compound time. And if compounding time is getting around people who have been there before. And I think it's the same. It's what you said. Most people are just willing to come from a good heart and just help. Now, don't get me wrong. Some people want paid and they should get paid if they want to. But I think there's a lot of people out there that just will give you their advice because they're probably there in their life because they were once you who was willing to reach out. So they kind of just understand like, oh yeah, I was that, you know, 38 year old person or, or whatever. And I was trying to get to the next level. Why don't I just hook them up with a solid and just give them some advice. And I feel like you create some of the greatest friendships by doing that because they find like-minded people. And I feel like we're just really all just trying to figure out how to connect with other people. And that's just like your Hold avenue if, if you're skilled. So, I mean, do you I think that, say, start, yeah, 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 I want to say I want to something really quick where you said, you know, people can feel vulnerable and you ask the question, like, why don't more people reach out and ask for help? Uh, I think because people associate, there's this thing called neuroassociative conditioning. And I'll give you another term to like look into for anyone listening, um, a term called dialectics. And um uh, what we neuroassociative conditioning would be similar. Uh, there's a lot going into it, but I'll give you one. It's what you associate words to, or what you associate, you know, uh, a meaning to with certain words, like vulnerability. A lot of people associate that with weakness, but when you see someone being vulnerable, you, you view it as strength, right? Like if I get up on stage, I'm like, Hey, 
you know, this happened to me. I screwed up this. I failed here. I, you know, I'd been arrested five times. Here's my story. And I'm like, I go through the whole thing. And you're like, wow, I can connect with that. I can connect with real. And so in, into dialectics is you can be vulnerable and still strong. I always say this like surrender with power. That's dialectics. It's like, I can be vulnerable and still strong as hell, you know? And um, it's like, I can accept myself for who I am and still have a desire to change. It's like, I can work on myself and still be whole at the same time. And that's what dialectics is. And so I think pe just most people just, they, they associate uh, vulnerability with weakness and it's just not. Well, it's like the, for example, if you told someone you're going to a therapist, I mean, the world sometimes will look at that and have a judgment to it. Right. And I'm like, wait, that person trying yeah. to keep them like they're paying someone to keep themselves together, talk to somebody, manage their life, you know, have a sounding board. That's maybe not a spouse or, 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 or a family member. Like that should be, that should be propped up as someone who's like, literally they're taking care of themselves. It should be applauded, you know, but totally. like, it's like you're saying, it's just kind of a different way to look at it. Is that that's not a, that's not a, not a broken person. That might be actually a person who's figured out life and he's keeping himself together. It's like, I, anymore, I say it's like preventative. It's like, I want to learn how I want to learn what, you know, why I behave certain ways I behave. I want to learn how to psychologically get through painful moments. I want to learn how to assign proper meanings to things instead of um, uh, these disempowering meanings that we associate with things. I want to know how to do that. And because, because so much of what we do is psychological, like 90 I think it's even more than 80, 90% uh, psychological. So, um, so yeah, I think it's an incredible thing. Like, like, like I said, it's, uh, and I, and I agree with what kind of actually kind of what you said, where you said it's also, I look at it. I have a desire for things to be easy and asking for help makes it easier, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. Like I recently, I was like, I want to get in better shape. So I was like the two things I'm like, I got to get a personal trainer. I have no idea what to do at the gym. Why would I think that I don't, and I don't have time to do YouTube. Why wouldn't I just pay someone for their skill? And then I'm like, I probably need to eat good. I probably need to get a nutritionist. And when I get on the call with my nutritionist every week on Saturday, I sit there and we just talk about things. And we almost, she's like my, my food therapist. Why'd you eat that on this day? And I'm like, I emotionally couldn't get through the feeling of eating chips and salsa. And she's like, okay, is there anything we can do that, you know, this is going to probably happen again next Thursday. Can we already set up something that when you have that feeling, you can still eat what you're supposed to eat. And as I'm sitting on my back at patio, doing my zoom call with my dietitian nutritionist, I'm just sitting there thinking like, wow, how much bigger your life gets when you just can sit down with people and say, this is where I want to go. This is my weakness. Hold me accountable. Let me talk this through with you because who else are we going to talk it through with? You know, I'm like, you know, just you got to talk to a person who specializes in that arena so they can try to help you out. Like that's what they do. It's the same as I sell real estate. Like they probably don't need to talk to their friends on how to buy a house at the kitchen table. They're going to give them all this nonsense. They need to come to me. I'm a professional. Here's the game plan. This is what you need to do. Listen to me. This is the best path to get there. So I just, I don't yep. know why more people won't just, you know, get to the spot where they hire coaches that hold them accountable. Here's another thing to look at, um, and that that you triggered through your you you speaking was, you know, I, I I tell this to leaders often is you can't not influence somebody that you judge, and I think when we're alone in our thoughts and we feel alone in like our growth or feel alone in this life, we tend to judge, self judge, and I always say this: the reason why you can't influence somebody that you judge like as a leader is because as soon as you meet somebody with judgment, their walls go up. And so yet a lot of us wonder why we can't move forward or why we can't grow or why we can't influence ourselves to be more, do more, you know, um, give more, create more. Um, and it's for most people that I see and I, not everyone, but most is they're in such a place of self judgment that, that like, all the walls up, they don't allow themselves to step out. And so by, by re, one of the ways to release, so it's like, how do you release self-judgment? And it's like, well, you can give some blanket answer like self-love. Okay, well, how else could you release self-judgment? Uh, you could do it by understanding that you're not alone. And, and you're not alone in your problems, your issues, your, 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 um, 
your, your limiting beliefs and those things. And so one way to release judgment is hire somebody that has been where you've been like a nutritionist, right. Or a trainer. So when you feel sore and you tell your trainer, you feel sore, you're not judging yourself for feeling sore. He goes, that's super normal. Like good job. That's actually a good thing. Or like, um, we did this the other day. That's why we hired that, 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 that real estate consultant, or the, I wanted to meet with that, the real estate consultant, the land advisor, because we were going through some things in our development company and we kind of felt alone in it. And it's easy to step into self-judgment. And so instead of doing that, whenever I have a, I want to step into self-judgment, what I tend to do instead of doing that, I have a a new like associative conditioning. Self-judgment means I need to ask for help somewhere. Okay. Wow. And I reach out and I meet the, I meet Jim and I realize all of the issues we're having in our company are very normal. Right. And so now I know that they're normal. I I'm not sitting there beating myself up because the ROI on beating yourself up zero. Right. (laughs) And so, and I see a lot of achievers do that. They kind of beat themselves up the mountain of success. And then, um, then they wonder why they get to the top and they're like, they're hung by an emotional noose right? It's like succeeding at the expense of your emotional health is not success. It's failure. And so um, w- one, w- one way to, to, to step out of kind of your judgment is to realize you're not alone. Like, so go ask for help. Go ask for help. Yeah, I think it's a good idea, man. I mean, that's what I even need to do more of that. So I'm always looking for like the next person. That's where am I trying to go? Who can help me? And I don't think you need them maybe for all seasons of your life, but I think it's important to note that there are seasons of life and you might need their advice um, or consulting for a, a period. And then maybe you get to a spot where like you now get it and you move on and you don't need that. But I, I find that I'm always going to be someone who's searching for someone to give me some type of assistance because to think that we you know, it's so odd, you know, we were growing, you know, you and I were growing companies, right? And Mm -hmm. I went to one day of Paradise Valley Community College. And yet there's some days in my company where I'm like, I never, like, how would I know this? You know, I'm just like, I I, I do good work. Uh, My reputation's good. People call me for a service. I I have people who help me go on appointments. But yet there's certain days I'm in my office. And I'm like, like you said, I'm beating myself up. Like, come on, like, you got to figure this out. I'm like, sitting back. I'm like, how how would I know this? Like, what did I do to ever, I didn't go to school for this or so I, I, the only thing I can do is just go get it from the streets and find somebody who's willing to give back. And so I just, I thank you for all the advice you've given right now. Cause I, it, yeah. I do this podcast sometimes selfishly just to, you know, call people up and I'm like, I want to pick their brain because I'm actually trying to grow. So this is my best excuse to learn. And then just uh, turn on the microphone for other people to learn. W- what do you, Dude, what are you most like excited about for like the next year? Like in like just in your personal life or your business? Um, in my business, and this is going to sound like some cliche ass answer, <laughs> but like what gets me the most excited um, in my business is, is seeing people, is seeing people kill it. And I think, um, and seeing people in my organization grow and move up and, and excel. Um, that always excites me. I love seeing people get into that, like just that next phase of growth in their business and or in their personal life. And so I, I love that. I love seeing people lit up and fulfilled. Um, that always excites me with regards to just like the most excited thing. I, I'm always, someone asks is what, what project are you the most excited about in the, in your development company? I always say the next one. So what excites me is the next, the next project, the next project that we're going on in building this, uh, in building and growing. So we have, you know, we just started, um, we just hired our, our home builder, a a guy who's been building custom homes for 25 years. So we have apex custom homes that we launched. Um, we have apex West or development company. We moved our team from Dustin running team to the apex real estate group. Um, so I, I tell, I write on my board up here and I write, it says apex everything. So I want <laughs> a, apex engineering. Um, we want, uh, apex commercial. We want apex, uh, we want to be doing it all. So, uh, I'm just really excited about the group of people I work with right now. You know, I, I say this to people often, if hard work's only hard, if you're doing it with the wrong people. And so I'm just excited about who I'm doing it with right now. Back to that, who, right. It's like, 
man, uh, do we have just, I've just got people where our values are aligned. And so like, that's what I found too, is you don't need, I used to have a coach said, you need to hire people who believe what you believe. And I, I actually disagree with that. I think you just need to hire people who have similar values. You know, we have a bunch of all different beliefs, but we value similar things. And so um, I'm excited to move forward with the people that we got. With a, a realtor who's out there selling homes now, who, who maybe is maybe struggling, what would be your best advice for that person? Just like maybe tactically or mentally? Straight up, if, if, if you're struggling, yeah. uh, like get with the team. I mean, th- the fastest way is to get an environment w- where people are already succeeding. So get with a team that has a good foundation, has good values, um, operates out of, uh, operates well and, and, and is, operates out of a growth mindset. Get with the team. That's, I, that's what I say. And I'm not saying that because I have a team, get with somebody else's team, get with my, you know, get with my competition's team. I don't care. Um, but get with a team. Now, if you're struggling with an agent, just in general, uh, you're probably making it too complex. Well, that- you're, you're, you're true when you said that statement, because before we started recording, you asked straight up like, Hey, I've got somebody in your area. Do you, you know, do you want to, yeah. would, would you call them to be on your team? And I'm like, sure. Yeah. I give them a call. So, I mean, you just, you just, I'm an environment guy. Right. So I like environment. Like I had a nutritionist. And I said, I struggle eating at night. And she goes, okay. Um, and I remember she said something like this. She goes, you, there used to be uh, signs in the airport that says, don't lay down on the chairs. <laughs> and what do people do? They lay down on the chairs, right? And so the, the airports got smart and they just put armrests up on the chairs. <laughs> but they put the armrests up too high so people could just lay under the armrests. So if you go to the airport today, the arm rests are really low <laughs> and that's creating an environment that demands what it is that they want. And so like me, my nutritionist that I work with, she, I, I struggled with it, man. I'm just, she goes, don't worry about changing you. Let's just change the environment. And I go, okay, what does that look like? She goes fast all day long and just eat your meals all at night. And so that's what I've been doing for the past like couple of years. Interesting. And then I just removed all of the bullshit out of my house. So even if I want to eat like shit, I can't. And so with a new agent, it's like, get in an, an environment that demands the results that you want. And so um, that, and then I would tell you this, I have, I, I have models for everything that I follow, everything. I have a model for my damn relationship. I know it sounds crazy, but I do. I have a model. And my model for real estate is very, very simple. And uh, I got this from, a lot of this was, was influenced by a guy, Ben Kenny. Yeah. Awesome dude. Um, but it's, it's, you need to learn what to say, how to say it. So I'll make it really simple. You're complicating it. If you're struggling in real estate, you're complicating it. Okay. So first thing that you need to do is you need to learn what to say, how to say it, when to say it. You need to learn the language of, of sales. So you can study that through scripts, you know, uh, get with a mentor, get with someone. If you're on a team, they've already got scripts. Let ask for the scripts, study them like mad, get good, understand communication. Um, there's a really great book called nonviolent communication get good at communication, get good at asking questions. That's 90% of communication in sales is asking questions. The second thing you got to reach out to people. Like I make it really simple on my team. It's 10 connects a day. I don't do the 20 connects, 30 connects, 10 connects a day. You need to connect with 10 people a day. That's it. Like I only have three standards on my team. Don't be an asshole, make 10 (laughs) connects and show up to our meetings. That's it. And so Learn the language of sales, one. Two, you need to start connecting with people daily, every day, consistently. And third thing, you need to be consistent and you need to follow up. It's really that simple. Anyone else that's trying to add anything to that is trying to sell you a package. They're trying to sell you frills. They're trying to make that the value proposition of their team. Like we have this system, this we have this CRM, we have this lights and, and lasers, we have <laughs> this text feature. And it's like, People leave teams for that kind of stuff. That's, that's, that, that's not, there's no like substance there. So um, keep it simple. And then the, I always say I have four frameworks for mindset. So you need to learn scripts, you need to lead generate, and you need to be consistent and follow up. That's it. That's your only job. And I can even make it even simpler is what's your job as a real estate agent to connect with people daily about real estate. That's it. Right. And then the mindset thing is people complicate things because of their mind. I have four. One, don't focus on any. I find this. Don't focus on things you can't control. 
Don't focus on results, focus on activities. Don't focus on what you don't have, focus on what you do have, right? And then focus on the present moment and what you're gonna create in the future. Oftentimes people focus on the past and then they worry about the future. And here's what I'll tell you. If you're worried about the future, oftentimes it's because you're not in action. It's really hard to worry about the future when you are doing everything in your power to create it instead of worry about it. That's it's funny. Like, you, it's funny you say that. I was, man, that just connects. I was sitting on my back patio a few days ago and I was thinking of something that I'm just trying to get done right now that I'm not being able to get done. And as I was sitting there, I said, man, you've been thinking about this for like two weeks. I'm just talking to myself. I'm like, you've been thinking about this for two weeks. And then I realized I'm like, wait, what's the one thing I need to do to get this ball rolling? And then right there, I was like, just do that. Anytime you like, you know what you want, what's the next step. And for the next 30 minutes, why think about everything else? Like if you're not willing to do that next step, which you know, the domino that's going to make this all happen, then just then bow out. Like at least be honest with yourself and say, mm. you don't want it bad enough. Like you said what you wanted, you know, the next step, you don't maybe know all the other steps, but I just sat there really like, I just sat there and that's exactly what I was thinking is like sitting there and thinking about that for 30 or 45 more minutes was going to do me no good, except for to almost worry, have a little bit of anxiety. And it, just, it was not a good place. And I'm like, this is just about action. And if you just actually spent the next 30 minutes doing that next action, you're in a better spot. So like, that's, that's yeah. cool that you said that. Cause I just went through that the other day, self-reflecting on my back patio. Yeah. And it, but kind of back to the psychology portion of it is like, what is thinking? And I'll give you the simple, ob obviously there's more to it. What is thinking? It's like, it's asking and answering questions and your subconscious does it so fast that you don't even notice it. And so if you want to learn to think better, then I would suggest two things. One, learn to ask better questions. There was a book in an NLP book a long time ago. I remember the chapter, chapter eight, and it said, questions are the answers. And so whenever I'm stuck, I ask myself, what's, what question am I not asking? And oftentimes it's like, you do know the next step. You just don't know. It's, it's step seven, eight, and 11 that, are, that are, are, are pausing you right now. Like, what's the next best step? Sometimes the next best step is finding someone who knows what three, four, and five are. Sometimes that is it, right? But um, thinking is, learning to think is powerful. And the best way you can do that is to learn to ask better questions. Um, I found successful people just ask better questions. And they ask harder questions and they ask questions. They don't always get the immediate answer to. I met successful people. They've been asking the same damn question for 20 years and they're still trying to get the answer to it. Um, but, and then the second thing is, is I would, I would tell you is to like, put your thoughts on a piece of, I don't really like the word journaling because uh, like I, I call it brain dumping. And so like write things down that's in your mind and in your head. And uh, I think those two things help with, with learning to think, but questions, it's like, you know, I, I remember one, I forget his name, Peter Di Diamantis, I believe. And he asked a question. He's like, what would you need to do to take your 10 year goal and make it happen in one year? You know, what's funny is that's exactly how, how I looked at our development company. I was like, man, in 10 years, I want to be worth this much money. What would it take to do that in a year? And the answer was start raising money. And so we raised $60 million in a year. And because of that, it's like we took a 10 year goal and had made it happen in like 18 months. So um, asking better and harder questions is, is, is a great way to, to, to learn to think and to expand on, on your thinking. Man, I could go another hour, bro. I mean, you, you're, <laughs> yeah. you're, you're wired differently. And I say that like as a huge compliment, like you're just Thank wired you. differently. I love following you on Instagram. Um, just like what you say resonates with me. And I really appreciate you, you jumping on. How could other people connect with you so they could get inspired as well? Like I do daily. Dude, I appreciate that a lot. And I appreciate your kind words because you're, you're, uh, you're incredible too. Uh, we have an, uh, we have a, um, 
we have a, a friend, Kevin Kaufman, and he talks incredibly highly of you. Uh, That's awesome. So I appreciate it. But the, uh, the best way to get a hold of me by far is 10 a.m. AZ time. I say AZ time because I think it's us in Hawaii. We're the only two <laughs> states that, that do not change uh, times. We have no daylight savings time. So uh, right now we're Pacific Standard Time, but it moves to Mountain Standard Time when the time changes. So Arizona time, 10 a.m., firedupfridays.com. It's free. It's an hour. Um, you know, we freestyle. Some days it's just me on there. Some days it's some friends of mine that are doing big things that are that are spitting stuff about leadership, growth, personal development, business strategy, whatever it may be. And then I also interview some of the best minds uh, in, in our, our space on there as well. And so um, firedupfridays.com is where you can find me. And then just all social media, Dustin Runyon. So, okay. Yeah. Everybody check out the fired up Fridays. I mean, they're Dustin, they're the best when you come from like framework and then you leading them. I understand that's super hard probably for like content wise, you know, it's like interviewing other people. You're like, you got, you, you bring them on. It's easier content, but man, yours are, yours are great. I'm going to actually share those notes with you. Like I said, so you have them. Yeah. Like, I appreciate you, that. You could dude. See them. Cause like I passed them around to probably 20 agents that day and said, Hey, take a look at this. This is Dustin's stuff. Sign up for his stuff. I think it can inspire you. Like it does me. And that's all I want to do is figure out how to give value to people. And you were that connect that day for me to add value to others. And I appreciate it. So yeah, well, thank you, man. I appreciate your time, buddy. Hey, thank you so much, dude. I appreciate you, Chris. Hey, thanks, Dustin. See you.